Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ask the CEO with Avraham Gatil. Today, I'd like to introduce a very special guest. She is the worldwide general manager of health and life sciences at Intel Corporation. She believes that technology like AI, VR, AR, 5G, and computer vision have the power to accelerate the transformation of healthcare and to improve health, quality of life, safety, and security worldwide. She works with companies, organizations, and governments around the world to help make this digital transformation real today. With 20 years of experience, she brings deep healthcare, life sciences, and biotechnology industry experience, along with a foundation in information and communication technology, and a view that spans across multiple other industries. She also regularly advises startups. During her time at GE Healthcare, she became a certified Sigma black belt and earned a patent for a system and method for a very early industrial Internet of Things solution around radiation safety medical imaging. She is the co-chair of the Global Health Security Agenda Private Sector Roundtable and sits on the boards of Digital Square and USA Healthcare Alliance. It is my pleasure to welcome Jennifer Esposito. Welcome, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the intro. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to the chat today. Absolutely. I'm so excited to be talking to you, Jennifer. And, you know, let's just uh, jump right in with something that we're all familiar with, and that is predictive analytics. Uh, we're familiar with that term with regards to the industrial Internet of Things. How is healthcare leveraging predictive analytics to not only improve the quality of care patients receive, but also to save lives? Well, you know, we're starting to see a lot more health systems take advantage of the digital data that's being generated in their electronic medical records to be brought to bear for, for clinical problem solving. And I think one of the first places where we've started to do some work over the last couple of years is around predictive analytics. So taking some of the clinical data and oftentimes linking it with other types of data that's available through the health systems to build predictive models around things like patient decline in the ICUs or sepsis um, uh, prediction, things like that. Very, uh, very distinct use cases and questions where we already know a lot um, of the science and medicine behind it and, and really leveraging that digital data that currently exists to put in place uh, algorithms that are able to really make some solid predictions that have repeatability and um, reliability. And it definitely beats uh, making guesses about uh, what the yeah. prognosis is gonna be. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Great. So there's a, another term, another buzzword that's in the industry called digital phenotyping. What on earth is that? <laughs> Yeah, I think this is pretty cool. Um, I mean, I think it's it's a pretty big big uh, terminology, right, for something that's relatively simple. It's it's leveraging the data that you as a digital citizen are generating either through your phones or wearables or other digital devices that uh, are on you or around you. And I think this is really going to be very important as we go into the future, particularly when we look at things like chronic disease, because it's really bringing a lot of new data to the table that we didn't have before. And um, I think it's really going to be very interesting and in really sort of shifting the conversation uh, to one that is more proactive, more preventive, more about health and wellness versus um, just about health care after the fact, after somebody's already become sick. Yeah, and I think also, e even for after the fact, that's going to be very helpful because how many times we go to the yeah. doctor, we don't even think about mentioning certain things, yet that information is right there and readily available. Yeah, absolutely. Think about also things like clinical trials and the ability to leverage that kind of data in real time and to really make a uh, very... Uh, quick assessments of how drug trials are proceeding, how you might be, be uh, uh, able to tweak dosage and things like that based on the stream of data that you're getting from the patient and around the patient. That takes away all that guesswork. Mm -hmm. Now, have any conversations been had around the governance of this kind of data? Well, I mean, there's definitely lots of conversations around the governance of the data, and I think it's a really important conversation to have um, to really make sure both that we are sharing the data in a secure way. I also think there's there's also been lots of conversations around just um, 
really from the patient perspective, taking a uh, greater possession or control over their data that is related to their health. And so I think those are challenges and conversations that we're all actively having right now, and they're very important to have and be open about because I think uh, we need to get to the point where we understand where we want to go from there so that we can actually start to benefit from using some of this data. Great. And a lot of what this new technology is leveraging in order to help us uh, benefit is uh, artificial intelligence. Now, mm -hmm. just like everything else in the industry, there, there are so many buzzwords out there. And unfortunately, artificial intelligence has also become a bit of a buzzword. How would you define artificial intelligence as it pertains to healthcare? Well, you know, I think of artificial intelligence actually quite broadly. I think, um, you know, what I like to say is that artificial intelligence or AI is happening now in healthcare, and it includes, you know, advanced forms of analytics. It's not just deep learning. It's not just cognitive computing. It's a very broad spectrum of analytic types and capabilities and tools that can be brought to bear to solve some of these challenges. And I think it's important to kind of say that because I also think that, um, you know, health systems and others really are somewhat uh, daunted by all of the hype that we hear on AI. And they think it means a huge investment in either hardware or software and other capabilities when in fact, a lot of times, um, they're able to leverage some of the infrastructure that they've already been building in-house uh, to get started on AI right now. So talking about AI and machine learning, um, there's so much that these technologies can benefit us in healthcare. However, in order for that to happen, we need to break down the silos that exist in digital health. Uh, and this includes access to electronic medical records, also known as EMRs. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I think, you know, when it comes to EMRs, 85% of health systems in the U.S. have an EMR at this point. They've invested lots of money in them. And I think what we're seeing is, is a sense of urgency from health systems around tapping into that data and, and really gaining insights from it. So I think up up until now, we've really not leveraged that data for meaningful insights, and we haven't necessarily uh, taken advantage of the, the new tools that AI has made available to us. So I think it's really important for us to think about that data and linking that data with other sources of data that are available, whether it is that patient-generated data that we talked about earlier or other sources of data that health systems already have available to them, whether it's lab data or pharmacy data, genomic data. I mean, there's lots of other data that would be very um, important to, to bring to bear to link up with the data that's already in the electronic record. And so I think that it's, it's time to really leverage AI to, to, to really you know, I think, you know, I like to say the, the electronic record is at least, you know, the way I think we, we generally see it being used right now is more about a system of record. And we are really pushing to make it more of a system of insight um, for patients today. Yeah. And like you said, there are multiple streams of data and there's yeah. no way we can, we can properly go through that without AI. A human's just not going right. to be process all that information. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And, you know, we, we all know, you know, any of us that have been involved in, in, in healthcare, at, you know, whether it's in resource research or clinical care, uh, that we only know a very small sliver of things, right? And we haven't really necessarily understood the, the benefit that we can really gain from putting all of these other sources of data together. Um, and this is really, I think, in my mind, where you start to really have a true conversation around precision medicine, what true precision medicine really is, um, you know, because I think true precision medicine isn't just about genomics. It's about leveraging all of these other sources of data together um, in new ways that are very unique to the patient. Yeah. And I think that uh, what you mentioned about the governance, the conversations around the data governance, I think that's going to be key in order to opening up those silos for uh, yeah. access to, uh, to AI and other technologies. So um, Jennifer, healthcare is moving towards something 
called value-based care. So that's another buzzword, uh, new kid on the block. How would you define that term and how are technologies such as AI and machine learning helping to improve the entire experience of a visit to a healthcare provider? Yeah, I mean, I, I think value-based care is, is a term that we've been, been talking about for what, five, six years now. Um, it it's, it's real. <laughs> what was that? Does it mean cheap? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I don't think it means cheap. I, I think it, it means paying for results or outcomes versus quantity, right? So it's about quality versus quantity. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's both the quality of the care being given, the abilities for patients to access that care, um, and, you know, being delivered at at the right price. It's not doesn't mean that it's cheap or low cost, but it's it's care that's you know valued at the right amount, commensurate with both the the results that's given and and really a lot of the other factors that involve. I also think it it um, is very important. I think you you already alluded to this. Is there's an element of value based care that is also very much about the patient experience or patient engagement. Um, and I'd also venture to say that it also has something to do with the, the experience of clinicians as well and their ability to engage with the system and, and uh, uh, you know, be able to deliver care. So I think it's a, it's a pretty all-encompassing uh, topic. And I think, you know, this is where things like AI and other technologies really can help accelerate really making this a reality because I, I think without some of these capabilities, whether it's AI or some of the other technologies that we'll talk about, you really can't move to that kind of a system. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, on that topic about patient care, so we actually have, uh, well, we have many questions that came in from the audience and mm -hmm. we're really excited about these topics, but one specifically on this topic. So we have a question from Zelig Weinstein. He's the former director of neuroradiology and interventional radiology at Bethesda Naval Hospital. And what Zelig says is, I know you've experienced the healthcare system as a patient yourself. Can you tell me how, if at all, technology played a role? Well, you know, at the time, um, and this wasn't that long ago, <laughs> and I probably didn't know as much about technology as I do now. I didn't really feel like technology was a big part of it. I think as a patient, you know, having to, um, for example, enter your information multiple times for different systems, that was definitely something that I experienced, and, and I think I still do to, to this day, right? Um, so I think there's an interesting opportunity there, right? It sort of helps uh, make the patient experience better. Um, from that perspective, if you can sort of minimize the amount of times that they have to engage and enter their information and, and sort of centralize their data. Um, I certainly experienced it from an imaging perspective and a treatment perspective as well. And I think, you know, having come from GE Healthcare, where I was, um, you know, very much involved with uh, radiology products and interventional products, it sort of gave me a comfort level to know behind the scenes, you know, how those systems worked. Um, but the one thing that that I, you know, I sort of think about when I, I hear that question was, you know, brings me back to AI a little bit because there was a point in my um, experience where I had to make a pretty tough medical decision and there was some debate within the clinicians about what we should do or what was necessary to do. And I, I kept pushing on um, my doctor to sort of give me a number so that I could make a decision that was based on a number that would give me some level of confidence that I was making the right decision. And he knew that I had, um, you know, some training in epidemiology and biostatistics, and so he knew I would appreciate uh, sort of going through a more detailed analysis, and he actually did a whole uh, Bayesian analysis for me to really sort of explain the two different treatment options that I had, or not even treatment options, but it's just a decision I had to make um, that gave me to a number, and it was a number that didn't have all that much difference in it, um, but now thinking back on it, right, if you think about if we had been able to leverage a lot of other data, both about me and other patients like me, um, we might might have been able to have a different kind of a conversation that was a little bit confidence building and sort of which decision pathway I should take. Great. Um, our next question is from Haslo Emma. She's a technology enthusiast with a finance expertise and a social media strategist at theextraordinaryonly.com. Uh, Haslow says, technology is great, but expensive. 
what measures have you put in place to ensure that products are available, accessible, and affordable to the end user? And can you mm -hmm. give an example? Yeah, I think that's a really great question because I think that, you know, and it goes back to what I said a little bit earlier, um, that, you know, there there is technology that is available today that a lot of people already have in their infrastructure, particularly in health systems, that that can be really, you know, put to work now. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to make a huge investment in new technology, for example, to take advantage of AI. And I think one of the things that my team and I work on a lot is working with our technology partners and solution providers in the ecosystem to really understand how to design the right architecture that is both, um, you know, delivering the best from a technology perspective, but is also efficient and cost effective, um, you know, from a total cost of ownership perspective. And also, I think, from the perspective of thinking about how do you sort of future proof yourself um, as you go into the future. So I don't necessarily think that, you know, these conversations always have to be about a huge investment in, you know, the latest and greatest thing. I think it's about really understanding what your needs are, what you already have from an infrastructure perspective, and how you can take advantage of it. And then how do you sort of build your own roadmap from there, whether it's from an investment perspective or an upgrade perspective, uh, to get to where you want to go in the future. Great. Our next question is from Trisha Howard. She's a client manager at Optive in New York City. And Trisha asks, how is VR being used for training purposes, such as in medical school? Yeah, I think VR is, is really, um, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in VR. We've done a lot of work with um, VR over the last couple of years. It's definitely, from a training perspective, being used in a lot of different ways um, to give people access to um, uh, images that they otherwise wouldn't, whether it's with a cadaver or something like that, right? So I think from a training perspective, it's it's very important um, and can really, uh, you know, accelerate the training of both medical students but other people um, in in the clinical arena. Um, but I also think it's it's giving you the opportunity to to see things in a way that you otherwise might not necessarily see as que clearly, and and um, you know, putting those things together in ways that you couldn't do in the real world as well. And so that's why I'm very excited about VR, AR. I also think from, from the perspective of VR that there are many use cases beyond training that we should be talking about from the perspective of, of where it fits um, in healthcare. And they also ha now have the capability for um, suits, uh, you know, body suits and gloves that provide haptic feedback. Haptics, so yeah. Will be mm -hmm. as, as if you're actually there doing it. Yeah, and then you know the ability to overlay information so that you can see multiple different things. Um, you know, to do things without necessarily having to touch in the operating room, for example, um, from a simulation perspective. So you know, I think the the list is is relatively endless. <laughs> and, yeah, and most probably AR will be. Uh, yeah much more than VR. Yes, I agree. Great. Our next question is from Anubhav Yadav. He's from Delhi, India, and he says, very few people understand AI, and even fewer people understand how AR and VR combined with AI will help in improving health for humans. How can we bring AI into the equation of physical health? Hmm. Well, you know, I think that um, one thing that's going to be really interesting is starting to think about how you apply things like computer vision. And so, so basically, you know, I think uh, thinking about AI, not just in terms of data points, but video and analyzing video and movement and other factors like that is, is a way for us to start thinking about how do you apply that to the physical world. Um, and so that's what I would say. And I think, you know, your comment around, haptics is is really important to responding to those uh, uh, haptics is really another interesting way to understand how the patient is interacting perhaps or, or even the person that's in training um, and so it's I think it's much more broad than 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 you know sort of thinking about AI just from the perspective of either images or data points um, in a spreadsheet or some other format 
Our next question is from Mirko Ross. He's the CEO of Ashwin.io in Stuttgart, Germany. There are some great stories about how AR and VR is used in psychotherapy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing um, both AR and VR being used, for example, in the treatment of PTSD, uh, different anxiety disorders. Um, so I think there's there's a lot of opportunity here. And also, you know, if you think about um, uh, the ability to deliver those kinds of therapy sessions in the home without the patient ever really having to go into the doctor's office, I think there's also a lot to be said for that value in this particular in these particular use cases. Um, so you know, the other the other we've done a little bit of work, for example, this year. Um, in uh, in China with our team with uh, a solution for children who have autism and it's it's all based on VR and it's something that they can do in the home and so again this sort of not only are you delivering treatment in different ways using AR and VR and I like to I know I know this term is out there we talk about digital phenotyping digital therapeutics is the other new term that we are talking a lot about and so being able to deliver prescriptions or software software prescriptions or um, VR prescriptions is really, I think, going to be something that we can talk about pretty soon here in a reality. Wow. And, you know, a year ago, this would have sounded like it's a pipe dream, but now we've got robots yeah. roaming the streets and we've got flying <laughs> drones transporting people. You know, this, uh, this is just the next thing uh, that's around the corner. Yeah, well, and we got drones delivering, um, you know, blood. There's uh, great examples in Africa of drone uh, deployments delivering blood and other critical medical supplies, right? So I think the, you know, some of the things that, that you know, on their surface might sound really strange um, are, are happening now in very real ways in healthcare. You know, I think that it's going to have another um, positive side effect, and that is I think many people that need treatments like psychotherapy or even just regular therapy, uh, mm -hmm. they may not seek out treatment because of privacy. You know, they, they yes. don't want to be seen. There's a stigma around mental health. The fact that mm -hmm. they could have that in the privacy of their own home, I think that's going to be huge in terms of saving many lives. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, we've been very um, supportive on Capitol Hill of legislation that's going to expand some of the telehealth telehealth access to uh, patients, for example, with substance abuse, namely opioid abuse um, problems. I mean, like you said, the the stigma sometimes of actually going to the office or just the complexity and difficulty of doing that is really mitigated by the ability to have a home visit. And, you know, right now that, that can be something as simple as a phone call, but as you, you know, as you and I have already talked, right, expanding that with enhanced video capabilities and analytics and then things like VR and AR are really going to change the game. Yeah. Our next question is from Ken Heron. He's the chief marketing officer of intelligent IoT messaging company Unified Inbox in Orlando, Florida. Ken says, hi, Jennifer. We have long dreamed about artificial intelligence curing cancer. From your perspective, what disease or chronic illness do you think will see the greatest near-term impact from our continued advances in AI and the computing power that makes it possible? Hmm. Yeah, I think it's a really great question. I don't necessarily think that it's about one disease or chronic condition versus another. I think it goes back to just this, this broader concept of capturing more data from and around the patient and so that you can be more proactive overall in their health. And this really does shift the conversation to a health and wellness one so that you're intervening earlier. Uh, people also have the possibility to benefit from AI, I think, as an educator, you know, to really give them ideas about how they're doing from a health perspective and a wellness perspective based on some of their activities or lack of activities. Um, and so that's why I actually think that, um, things like chronic disease are going to be impacted first. And that impact is also going to play a very big role in informing diseases like, uh, forming, infor you know, uh, uh, predictions and uh, treatment decisions around patients who then develop uh, acute conditions or, or cancer or other diseases like that. 
Um, so I think for me, it's, it's a much more comprehensive conversation. I'm, I'm all for capturing more data um, and, and opening up uh, the aperture, uh, particularly around chronic disease, because I think that shift to health and wellness is going to have a really big impact overall on the population um, as a whole. Our next question is from Jan Barbosa. He's a brand ambassador at BB Inc. in Puerto Rico. And Jan says, there are so many possibilities of AI in the field of early cancer detection and treatment, but efforts seem timid. Could AI deliver now a safe and cost-effective way to detect and treat not only cancer, but Alzheimer's and Parkinson's as well? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's a few things going on. Uh, I think sometimes our ability, for example, with AI to predict some of these things um, or at least identify, you know, the ones that are right matches from a, a marker perspective um, are sort of, uh, in advance of our ability to to treat them from a medical perspective, right? So there's sort of a, a dichotomy there and the medicine has to catch up to some degree with some of these analytic capabilities that we have. And I think that's really the conversation um, that's happening right now. I think we have some really very clear examples where we can, uh, it, from a genomics perspective, predict people who will have cancer or understand the right treatments that they uh, can personally uh, benefit from, um, but that's in very specific cases. And so, as we broaden this and understand more using AI, um, you know, there's there's a little bit of a catch up that has to happen between that that part of the science and the medicine and the care delivery itself. And then, with uh, nanotechnology, you can get things like a uh, virtual colonoscopy and a lot of other kinds <laughs> of early detection. Yeah, and I think, you know, we've been talking for a long time about, you know, when you, when you start to talk about early detection, when do you intervene? Do you intervene, right? So there's lots of really interesting questions that um, come from all of these conversations and all of these additional capabilities. And I think there are important questions to be had um, so that we don't sort of run the risk of going down the wrong pathway. Um, and, and, you know, in the end, people ending up either not trusting or fearing the, the information that we're getting. Yeah, that's a great point. Our next question is from Suda Jamti. She is the CEO of IoT Disruptions and also the author of 2030, The Driverless World in Silicon Valley. Suda says, what is the biggest digital transformation challenge you are seeing in healthcare with regards to adopting AI and predictive analytics, and are there some players in the healthcare value chain being more adaptive to change than others? Yeah, and I, we've done a lot of work with different health systems. You know, there's there's a few, um, there's a blog and a case study that we recently put out with uh, the work that we've been doing with Montefiore, and I think that's a really good example of a case where you have a health system that really had a need um, in order to leverage AI to use data to be more predictive. But I think one of the reasons why what they have done has really worked is that they have really been very considerate about how to fit that into the clinical workflow so that it's not this sidebar thing that somebody has to check separately in some other system, which makes it very difficult to really leverage it in day-to-day -day normal use. And I think that's one of the things that I see over and over again as a sort of a challenge that people experience. If they haven't really thought about the clinical workflow and how do you really get clinical staff on board for using it and making it easy for them to use it, that they run into these challenges and then the projects or the pilots, you know, fail. And then as a result, there's a, a sort of a backlash from, from doing more of it. Um, so that's, that's one thing I would, would really, um, uh, sort of highlight as a, you know, a warning, make sure you're, you're considering the workflow and have that planned out and have a feedback loop so that you do know if people are actually using it and if it's been effective so that you can continue to iterate on what you're doing. Great. Our next question is from Neville Gaunt. He's the founder of MindFit LTD in the UK. And he asks, 
will AI keep the cost of development down in the health industry and provide more effective health care for young people, uh, reducing stress, which accounts for 50% of sick days in the U.S., in the U.K., for instance? Well, yeah, I, I you know, number one, I think it'll, it'll certainly reduce costs and, you know, and sort of, I think it's overall going to reduce some of the cost that's involved in, in doing research and studies because it's going to automate some of that. It's going to make it more, um, less manual. So there's less, uh, uh, intensive work that has to go into it. And I think going back to, um, what I was saying earlier about health and wellness, I think for, for younger generations, right, this is about using AI at all points in your life to understand uh, your own health and wellness and fitness and how you can uh, sort of take advantage of that to uh, to really, you know, prevent certain diseases that are preventable or conditions that are preventable um, by perhaps uh, changes in lifestyle and things like that. But even just monitoring sometimes really has an important impact as well. So, you know, I also think that as the, the science progresses and people are able to use this information, um, for greater predictive value that some of the stress, for example, that comes along with the uncertainty around uh, symptoms you're experiencing and conditions that you might have also could be alleviated. Yes, I, I know certain teenagers that would stress a whole lot less. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, cool. So our next question is from Mike. Quindazi. He is the U.S. Digital Alliance sales leader at PricewaterhouseCoopers in Los Angeles. And Mike asked, how should we contemplate end-of-life decisions as AI increasingly influences diagnostics and treatments? Hmm, that's really interesting. You know, I think, again, this is a place where the more information you have that you can bring to bear to making a decision is, is really going to be important. So, um, you know, end of life or any other decision that you're making around your treatment or paths to take uh, is, is really going to benefit from the additional insights that you're going to get with the help of AI and with the help of actually um, incorporating more data types and formats into your decision making. So Jennifer, what are some of the ways that Intel is making a difference in healthcare? Well, I think, you know, we as, as an organization, um, we work very closely both with end users, so the people that will you know, use the technology at the end of the day, as well as partners in the ecosystem to really make sure that 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 technology is being leveraged to the to the best extent possible, right? So I talked a little bit about the fact that sometimes we'll work on things like reference designs or reference architectures. You know, it's a way to really understand how you can take different parts or different technology ingredients, you know, all the way end to end up and down the stack to um, build solutions that address some of these core industry use cases and challenges. And, and also another role that I think our team plays is in understanding what some of the really unique industry use cases and challenges are that the healthcare industry is experiencing. So that as we work with um, our colleagues in our engineering teams and in our business units that, you know, we're thinking about what might be needed down the road from an, a roadmap perspective. Um, so, you know, we're doing a lot of work right now um, in AI, particularly around um, imaging. We're doing a lot of work in genomics. We've, we've got a long history in, um, in genomics, optimizing the, the, the code so that sequencing can happen more quickly and efficiently and cost effectively. We're doing a lot of work also in, in the space of, of telehealth and telemedicine um, because um, we really think that leveraging uh, care outside of the hospital, helping move it to the home and into the community using uh, wearables and other sensors and our capabilities that will get enhanced as we deploy 5G is going to help um, accelerate the ability to deliver care outside the hospital. And then I think, you know, we talked a little bit already about VR and AR. Um, you know, I think that presents a massive amount of benefit from the perspective of, of patient engagement and the ability for um, 
clinicians to prepare for surgery, for example. And, you know, I think the, the list of use cases that we've been talking about with respect to VR and AR is almost, uh, almost endless. So we talked about a lot of exciting new technologies that are, uh, that are happening today. What are, mm-hmm. What's next for healthcare? What's next? Well, I think that, um, you know, I think that we're going to see um, the gradual adoption of AI, you know, in the next, like I think in the next 12 months, right, where we really have a very critical point here where a lot of that hype has to sort of come to reality. And that's why I've been really stressing that I think that um, there's a lot that health systems can do today with AI, with their existing infrastructure uh, to make a, a real difference in, in patients and even in, in, in how clinicians are able to work uh, within the system. So that's my prediction. I think the next 12 months are really critical, but I think what we're going to start to see is, is true use of AI at, at a broader scale um, in clinical care. Um, and I think that that also means that we will, we will continue to tap into these new sources of data that I was talking about earlier. And that's also going to be a very important, I think, sort of pivot point for healthcare in general, because it really is information that we haven't used before that is really going to bring a lot of interesting uh, information into the puzzle that we're, we're all trying to solve. We're certainly living in exciting times. Yeah, great. <laughs> so Jennifer, how do people connect with you? Well, I am on Twitter. So my Twitter handle is uh, Jennifer Espo, E-S-P-O, all one word. And then LinkedIn also, very active on LinkedIn and happy to chat with people on either one of those platforms. Uh, get in touch and connect. Great. And I'll post that to the show notes so people can just click on that and get right to you. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I'll also send you the link for um, my blogs that we have hosted on the Intel site. Um, there's one about digital phenotyping that might be of interest to people. And uh, just one last thing is our website is intel.com slash health, and you can get some additional content there. Great. And I'll, I'll add that as well. Great. Jennifer, do you have any parting words of wisdom that you'd like to share with the audience? Well, I think that... Um, you know, I am very excited about technology, not just because I work in a technology company. I think um, I think that healthcare is an industry that it has a lot of opportunity to take advantage of technology, and I think that we should all go, you know, running into it with a lot of um, of hope for some really pretty accelerated change. And I know that with with those kinds of changes, sometimes comes fear and concern, but I think we have a really big opportunity here. To, to really change things fundamentally in ways that haven't happened before. Um, so I'm, I'm really hopeful, very excited about the future, and, and definitely very interested in continuing this conversation with anybody that wants to reach out. Awesome. Jennifer, thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom. I really enjoyed having you on the show. Thank you.